Why write? Because everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Why Write. I'm your host, Angela Grout, and thanks for tuning in to another episode to learn how you can be a writer too. Today I have two, as you can see on my screen, two guests coming on to the show. And you know, we're zooming because one of us is uh in Richard Rossi is in California, and we have Kelly Tabor and she is in New York. So thankful to the Zoom world that has brought us together that we can all be in the one place at the same time, but in different locations. So, you know, I want to tell you that these two are have co-written a book called Lucy and the Lake Monster. And today we're going to find out not just about how they went about co-writing their book, but how they're making it into a movie, because I'm fascinated with this. Uh, some of you may know Richard Rossi. Richard Rossi has been a, uh, he is an author of multiple books. He's written a lot of books that you know, about, you know, losses and, and grief. And he's written them to help other people. He's also been a script writer, a screenwriter, a songwriter, and an actor. And a few of his scripts have actually been recommended to the Academy Awards and for an Oscar. So it's very exciting to have someone with so much experience and talent to be able to share his wisdom on how he's put together a book. And, you know, with, with his friend or co-writer uh, Kelly Talbot, we're going to find out how this, you know, fourth grade teacher from South Carolina, you know, who's been teaching for over three decades, um, you know, started sharing stories with her class. I mean, obviously to educate them, but also they're inspired from her hometown on Lake Champlain. And this is where Lucy and the Lake Monster comes into play because we're going to hear all about the Lake Monster that Kelly grew up with and how it became a book and, and a movie. So welcome so much to the show, Richard and Kelly. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. So, you know, I have to ask, uh, you know, of course, you wrote a book about a lake monster. And I know, Kelly, you grew up on Lake Champlain. Yes. And there's this legend of a, <laughs> you know, sort of sea monster in the lake, kind of the American uh, uh, Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> So can you tell us a little bit of, about that and how you got to, you know, develop a stories about it? Well, from the time I was a very little girl, I, I had heard stories about the Lake Champlain monster and I was very young and I was very interested being curious about it. And my father owned a cabin on Lake Champlain and that's where I spent my summers actually. And so I'd hear about people who had seen Champ and that's what they call the Lake Champlain monster. And, uh, I was just excited to look for it. So my eyes were always looking at the lake. My my dad had a little boat and I used to go out by myself. I used to go out with friends, family. And, you know, it's just something that I always did. And my friends, there were a lot of people always looking. So, so and I'd heard stories. I've even had family members who had seen it. And that made it even more exciting because I thought maybe I'll get a chance to see it, see it because champ, um, he never, we never really know when he, he or she, whatever it is, uh, decides to appear. So it's always a surprise to everybody when we do get the opportunity yeah. to. Obviously, to you didn't have to come up with the character's name for your book because Champ was already <laughs> given his name from Lake Champlain, I'm assuming. Um, right. And because you never saw him, you had this imagination of what this monster looked like. Um, you know, I think I think he, the monster might be available to be shown right now. One of you have the monster to show. I see a couple of flushes. Richard, ha Richard has one too. Do you have it right there, Richard? So, hello, Hi. Champ. Welcome to the show. Um, Hi, thank I, you for I, having it looks me. It a little bit like the form of a dinosaur, a little bit, but obviously it's a lake monster. Yes, it's like a, a little alligator slash. You know, uh, well, it's like a. Well, this one it happens to be a plesiosaur, and that's what we tend to think it might be is a a, a plesiosaur. So that's what we're going with. <laughs> so, you, so you're sharing these stories of Champ, the lake monster, and Lake Champlain with your classmates. I mean, with your students. And then, how? When did you make the decision that you know what? This could be a book. I could write a book, and you know, and then to hook up with Richard Rossi. Like, tell us about that. 
Well, my students love the stories that I always told. I didn't tell them just about Champ. I had two older brothers that I grew up with. <laughs> so a lot of the stories uh, were about times growing up. A lot of them were true stories that had happened. And we did writing in class. I taught all subjects. And so a lot of times I would always start with a story to kind of give them a boost or an idea of what they could do in, the, in their writing. And so they loved, they liked my stories and they became, I became known as the storyteller and they, they always wanted me to write a book, but I never ever thought I would because, you know, being a teacher is kind of, it's not full time, but it kind of is <laughs> with all it's, the lesson plans and grading Kudos papers. to you for being a school teacher because that is a yes, superhero. And, uh, Richard was a dear friend of mine and I happened to tell him we met back in the 80s and I told him about, you know, my class and my classroom. And um, I always had stories to tell about my students, how wonderful they were and how encouraging they were. And I told him about the stories I told about the Lake Champlain monster. And Richard approached me and he said, Kelly, how would you like to write? Um, how would you like to join with me with a book series and film series on Champ, the Lake Champlain monster, a fictional story? And I was I was blown away because what a wonderful opportunity. I've always loved to write and Richard is fantastic and and he's a dear friend and someone I can trust and I knew that he wouldn't lead me astray. He would he would um it, it's always so helpful to have a him. mentor who's a friend who has yes. the experience. And he, we're a dynamic team together. He's just wonderful and um a great mentor too, because I've never direct or been an assistant director to a movie before or written a real book. You know, I've written a lot with my students in my classroom, but that's so, what it Rich was. Richard, you just happened to be having this conversation with this li lifelong friend. And do you immediately say, we got to make that into a book or, you know, how, how does that come about? Well, um, I work as an actor here in Hollywood. I live in Hollywood and I just, played a role of uh, Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. And I was thinking as I was playing that role, he was a minister, Charles uh, Dotson, whose pen name was Lewis Carroll. And he was friends with a little girl that the associate pastor's uh, daughter, Alice Slidell. And I thought, I'd really like to do something for kids. And I then had some medical problems. I almost died and I had a wonderful surgeon, Dr. Julio, who saved my life. And so my bucket list was to do something for children. And um, I became a grandfather for the first time. And I wanted to do something that when uh, my grandchildren are bigger and start reading that they could read. And uh, it just hit me like an epiphany that Kelly's childhood looking for champ in her stories that are so powerful that, that for decades these students love them. In fact, she's had students go on to graduate Ivy League universities and come back and visit her at the school and say, would you mind telling me that champ story again? So I thought there were these elements with the, the plesiosaur champ, this guy. <laughs> I thought that, you know, it'd have a fascinating magical quality um, because when I was little, I just was really interested in cryptozoology, you know, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster. And I also saw it as an allegory for the spiritual search because Lucy has such a pure heart and believes in champ. There's a scripture in Mark 9, 23 that says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to the one who believes. So I thought it'd be wonderful for my grandchildren, a story of a grandfather and his granddaughter going out in the rickety rowboat and looking for champ. And, um, Kelly and I've had so much fun working together. Um, the, the the look in the faces of children when we've done book signings, they line up hundreds of kids, line, lines around the block. And when they meet us and get their champ book and we sign it and I draw a little plesiosaur in the inside cover for each each kid because I like cartooning. And, well, I um, followed your journeys on your book signings on your Facebook pages and it really yeah. is, it's exciting and, and you know really builds up the momentum of wanting to see a movie. Yeah, when uh, when I draw Champ, he's kind of more a little bit more cartoonish like this. Yeah, so the kids are real excited about the movie when we visit schools. They're they're just when's it coming out and what's Champ gonna look like in the movie? So we're so working. we're smiling when we're saying the word Champ, but of course in the title it says you know Lake Monster. So you know is it something that the children fear? Is it is the monster you know Champ scary at all in this book? Well, it's interesting because the, the spiritual allegory for God 
in my view of religion, there's um, healthy faith that heals versus like toxic faith that hurts. And people with a healthy faith have a view of God as benevolent and loving and compassionate, a heavenly father that cares for them, Abba Father. But religion that I've seen be very harmful and abusive often represents God as this monster that wants to damn 99% of humanity and torture them in hell. So there's a, like C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, it's a children's story with spiritual allegory. So to the pure hearted like Lucy, Champ is super friendly and, and that's her best friend, right? But to the villains in the story, um, these will be mission mercenary Mike, they portray uh, Champ as a monster and that they have to capture or kill him. And so um, it works as a children's story. The boys and girls around the world love it and send us beautiful letters and drawings of Champ that they make and tell us how much they love the book. So the kids all love Champ, but to the wicked, Champ is scary. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And, you know, I'm going to sl- not side sidetrack too far, but, you know, Richard, you kind of started off your your life's career as, mm-hmm. you know, in, in scriptures, you know, because you, mm-hmm. you know, were um, a reverend. I mean, you still are, but, you know, so here you, you're doing spiritual enlightenment work. And now, you know, the scriptures that you are following are having you create these different scripts. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you use the word scripture and script in the same sentence because that's a wonderful wordplay there, going from scripture to scripts. I find that art is a ministry. Jesus taught in parables or in stories. And um, I try to do things now that are accessible to people universally and not just to say the church world or the Christian world. Um, I was just reading last night, my son and I have been reading some books by a priest named Henry Nouwen, who is a wonderful, one of the best preachers of the 20th century, along with Martin Luther King Jr. and Billy Graham. And Henry Nouwen would intentionally not uh, put in his books, Father Henry Nouwen, because uh, he didn't want to put people off that he was some holier than thou, you know, religious guy, even though he was a priest and people knew he was a priest. He intentionally wanted to do things in a creative way that wasn't uh, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, was the same way. He was an ordained Presbyterian pastor from my hometown of Pittsburgh, and he was the same way. Most people that watch his kids' show uh, don't know that he was a pastor and that the Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was part of his ministry to children to share love and nurture them. But um, it's an love interesting that. background. I love that. I mean, you know, we we all search for our ministries and how we're going to share a story or leave a legacy. And, you know, it is a matter of doing God's work and coming through us, you know, how we're going to present it. And, you know, I mean, I've always, you know, been interested in writing books and creating movies and, you know, kind of whether it's to leave my own legacy or to just channel these stories to bring them into light. And, you know, knowing that that is you know, a, a, a God given gift, you know, I mean, it's, it's beautiful when you have that passion behind what you're doing, because when the passion is there, you move forward with it and you know, you're, you know, following the word. Um, yeah. And from a theological perspective, um, it says in Genesis that God created humans in the divine image. And so God is creator. And another word for artist is a creator. Yes. And so when we create, it's one of the most spiritual things we can do that bears witness that we are created in the image of the creator. When we create, as in the beginning, God created in the heavens and the earth, you created the world of, of April rain or, and a day at the park. And we created the world of Lucy and Papa and, and Champ. And so whenever we create something, it gives our lives so much meaning. It's like a meditation for our souls. And then when people read it, it becomes a meditation for them to think about. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Now, Going back to you said Lucy and Papa, I mean, you know, I know you've created these great characters and I want to talk about, you know, some of the why behind you wrote the book. I mean, we know based on, you know, Kelly saying that she shared these stories, but like why decide to collaborate on a book? Um, and, you know, like how the how of how the two of you co-wrote this book on, you know, separate opposite sides of the continent. <laughs> I answered the last couple. So did you want to take that, Kelly? Well, it was a challenge at times, but we worked it out. A lot of times uh, we would develop different ideas and come together and go over them together. Sometimes we would come up with ideas and me being a fourth grade teacher for, well, mostly I've taught over, uh, over 30 years, but I've been in first, second, third, 
and fourth grade. Fourth grade was the most. And I kind of knew how fourth graders would think and talk based on my experience with them so much. And so we would actually role play and we Richard Richard would dictate the things that I'd say because I would try to imagine the things that my fourth graders would have said. Oh yeah. That's to, to make yeah, it realistic. See you totally being able to do that. You're so experienced with it. Because even though it's a fictional story, we want it to be believable too. And so yeah, I, that, and I think that's important with any kind of fictional story. You know, we want I mean unless you're doing sci-fi or doing you know, like real fantasy, you, you need to make sure that it makes sense, you know, and that the people really are doing believable things in the story. Right. So we did a lot of video calls, conferencing back and forth a lot. <laughs> um, and this is a chapter book. I do want to just let young to know it's a chapter book. It's not a picture like children's book. It's an actual, you know, 190 page chapters, <laughs> chapter book. And I'm glad you clarified that because I have one of my dearest and oldest friends, Steve, uh, got the book to read. And uh, he just said to me, I thought this was a kid's book, a picture book. And I'd read this thing in 10 minutes. This is 190 pages. I got to dedicate more time to read this. Right, right. Like, you know, my uh, Day of Spark is a children's book. You know, there's illustrations and it's, you know, geared more for helping teach, teaching social learning, development and reading. But, you know, yours is this adventure that, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth graders, you know, love that kind of adventure. But like, I'm going to compare it a little bit to like Disney stories and, you know, Pete and Puff the Magic Dragon, things like that, because those also have stories and morals and lessons for adults to get out of it also. So just because, you know, we're saying you you wrote from that fourth grade level and stuff, it's it's for everybody. It's a story for all. Mm. Yes. And another important thing that Richard and I thought was important is to address some of the issues that um, I know that children go through being in the school system. I know that they deal with grief. I know that they deal with loss, anxiety, fear, all those types of things. So we wanted to address those in the book and movie as well, so that when children or adults read it, they can glean from uh, the positive ways to react and handle some of those situations for a good yeah. outcome. It's, it's definitely important that books and stories are shared and told and seen because it is a way of not only, you know, um, I don't want to use the word preaching, but it's a way to instruct and educate and, you know, give the wisdom of how to handle certain situations, you know, and especially for kids. I think, you know, they they like to see a little bit from their peers how to act. So when you have characters like Lucy, you know, they can learn from Lucy and her papa and, you know, obviously the lake monster on how to handle certain situations. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, of course, as a writer, you know, all of us writers want to know, like, did you make an outline first? You know, did you share a Google Doc and you went back and forth and edited it? Did you do this in a certain program like, you know, Final Draft or Celtex or, you know, whatever it is? How did you go about, you know, doing that? Did you just email each other storylines? Well, we're kind of old school. <laughs> like right now we're developing um, the next two books in the series. And so we have flashcards and we come up with ideas. And so we're both keeping our flashcards and ideas for different scenes or different chapters, what it's going to be about. And every time we get an idea, we keep adding it because we have great ideas, but we don't know where they're going to go yet in the story. I yeah, love so the show and tell. Here's book yeah. uh, two and three. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, the, and this one here that we're talking about is book one, which is, you know, that yeah. has been put into script format. And I, you know, I know that you just got done shooting 30 days. So it's completely, um, you know, I guess the word is recorded at this point and you're in editing and with Richard, I mean, you've been a script writer kind of, you know, the majority of your life writing scripts in Hollywood for, you know, big screens and, you know, you've worked on shows like, uh, Allie McBeal and uh, I'm trying to think of the funny one. I can't. I don't know. Anyways, um, you know, it's like you've had all this experience that to take the book and transform it into a script. How long does that take you to do? Um, that was um, an interesting process because um, I wrote the script. You mentioned programs. I did it actually in Celtics, which was free, uh, yeah. although I recently bought Final Draft. Um, I tend to, uh, you know, Kelly and I are both uh, penny pinchers, as her dad says. Um, so um, I did it for, on a free program. Um, 
And but I always like to leave some room for improvisation with actors and things that are created in the moment. Um, not to give away too much. I hope Kelly doesn't get mad at me. She says, don't give away too much, Richard. No, no. But I'll give you an example <laughs> of an improvisational moment that wasn't in the book that happened on set. Um, there was a wonderful pastor, Rick Lewis, who allowed us in his church facility to keep our equipment near the, his churches in Port Henry near the lake. And uh, some of our crew even stayed at the church on uh, some cots in different Sunday school rooms. But um, we were there and um, it was where we'd meet and have breakfast before we shot each day. And so Kelly was, was uh, the driver and I was literally at the end of the day because I'd had several surgeries and physically my doctor didn't even want me to shoot at this time, didn't feel I was up for it. So at the end of each shoot day, I could barely get out of the car. It was a struggle to get me out of the car. But anyway, so Kelly pulls up to the church and um, Emma, who's our leading lady, Emma Pearson, a wonderful actress, yes. uh, nine years old actress, plays our lead. Her mother was on set with us, uh, Sasha. Well, Sasha happened to be in a white dress, and Sasha has long blonde hair. And Sasha walked, as Kelly pulled up and we parked, uh, Sasha walked in front of the car. And uh, I looked at Sasha, and it was like this transcendent moment where, in my imagination, she was like an angel otherworldly because the sun kind of hit her blonde hair and she was luminous and around her face and she had the long white dress and looked so lovely and otherworldly that it hit me like a ton of bricks a whole scene uh, because Emma's uh, Lucy's mother has died and she, that's why I play Papa the grandfather and I have to take care of her she's an orphan and this whole idea hit me that she would see the mother in spirit form as like an angel or a ghost. And um, so I got out of the car <laughs> and I told Sasha, I said, I have an idea. I hope you'll be open to it. I love that. I love inspiration. And, you know, yeah, I just said, you, you in look the moment, so, you know what you need. Yeah. I said, in that white dress, you, you look to me like this archetype of purity of of heaven yeah what do you what you need in the story yeah Helps and so we over. have a we have a scene i, I guess no i won't problem. give away too much okay okay i'm gonna but i'm gonna cut you off so that me. you don't we gotta me. see it we gotta read but it. everything everything originally that was planned that day was clink canceled and we and richard developed this <laughs> whole new a uh, whole new scene and it ended up being absolutely wonderful and i love his sporadic ideas that he comes up with sometimes are always so good. We never know when it's going to happen. That's what makes it so interesting and exciting too. Yeah. I, I mean, I know just from, you know, me trans, uh, you know, transcribing the book to a script, you know, you try to keep it as authentic as you can to the written word that has been already created. And, you know, now that you're working on book two and three, are you finding that you maybe you want to make the movie first and then write it? You know, yes. it's funny you would ask that because I suggested that to Kelly because the <laughs> filmmaking process created things that improved the story. And so I'm thinking in two and three, perhaps we would make a novelization, which in other words, you film it and then you write the novel as close yeah. to what is on screen. Yeah. That's and there's awesome. so many books that go both ways. So it's it's interesting to yeah. learn and see that process and understand why writers, you know, go each route, you know. Yeah, and a lot of books become films like the Harry Potter series. Mm -hmm. Or when I was a real little boy, um, and I'm 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 the old guy of the three of us. But when I was a real little boy, uh, in a first grade, there was a best-selling book called Love Story, and it was kind of a modern-day Romeo and Juliet tale of a couple that fall in love in college, and it and it ends in tragedy. Um, the uh, the girl uh, gets sick and passes, but it's a deep, deep love. And it was just a phenomenal bestseller. And so that book, so many people were into that book that when that film came out with uh, Ryan O'Neill, may he rest in peace, he passed recently. And um, uh, who was it? Um, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the woman that played uh, the woman, um, Allie, Allie McGraw. 
Ali McGraw was the girl he falls in love with. But there was this synergism often of like a, a book being a bestseller, and that creates that anticipation for the film. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I am definitely anticipating the, the movie of Lucy and the and the lake monster. So, you know, you wrote the book, you published the book, you wrote the script, you shot the movie, you know, you, there's a lot of planning and doing both, you know, cause of course, you know, after the book is done, there's still the formatting and the editing and picking, you know, the pages and the font and the book cover. And, you know, I know for the book, there's some art artwork that you needed. So, you know, trying to mm -hmm. find someone who can put the artwork in and then like in a movie, you know, after, after putting together the whole, you know, location list and putting together the characters and doing the casting. I mean, it's like, you know, it just keeps going. Now, you know, I get exhausted thinking about all the work that goes into mm -hmm. it. But, you know, now that it's, it's filmed, like you need to do the scoring and put music in and do your sound effects. And, you know, how did you budget and how do you keep in your budget and, you know, come up with the money to do all of this stuff? <laughs> Well, you know, um, I have a philosophy that's kind of outside the box uh, of what other people do. Most people, like a big studio, all those tasks you mentioned has hundreds of people. When you look at the end credits of a film with Steven and Spielberg. And big budgets. Yeah, and big budgets. Like Steven Spielberg has hundreds and hundreds of people doing what a handful of us did on Lucy and the Light Monster. Um, so as a nonprofit ministry, media ministry, we don't have like a huge budget. In fact, we usually go out, start with no budget and no, sometimes no money in the bank. And so my philosophy has always been like, if you feel called to do something, step out and do it. You know, it's like Indiana Jones in, in one of those films. He has to step over this cliff, this chasm, or he's going to fall to his death. But he has to take a step into the air. But as he takes each step, the uh, bridge beneath him, the path, materializes as he steps so that's what we do we take steps and raise money for each step like we had an indiegogo uh before i think before shooting and raised uh five grand very yeah and you've done gofundmes and you know yeah. everything for this film is really donations yeah so now we're doing a gofundme um if, if that's on there right now if people go to gofundme they can just search bring lucy and the lake monster to life and I think we've raised about 3,500 so far, and that's mostly just to finish the film and distribute the film. So, you know, God kind of provides as we go. I mean, when we went to New York, it was a huge step of faith because here we have cast and crew, and we want to make sure they're fed and housed yeah. and all that. And in the summertime, the prices go way up in that area because everyone's coming for the vacation. Um, so uh, that was kind of scary, and I wasn't doing too well physically. Um, so it was a huge step of faith. I remember going to New York, like God, we're going to be like, God, God's going to have to come through like Indiana Jones and materialize that path for us because, and, and it went, it went well. Yes, it was a roller coaster ride, but I tell you, Kelly Tabor, she was a superhero wonder woman. She, she wore about 12 hats and was, a, she was like a master juggler, like the old Ed Sullivan show when I was a kid where the person, you know, spins well, 20 she's a woman. To one. she's a woman we do that exactly exactly that's right you know <laughs> women know how to do that we can you know grow a baby <laughs> and cook dinner and write a book all at the same time yes yeah, so bravo I kelly i wanted to say as a school teacher i was used to you know teaching science and we would do science experiments so if i have 20 something kids in my room i'd always have to make sure everybody had the materials that they needed so it's kind of something that my mind was used to doing. And yeah, so when used I used to mapping out the plan for yeah. everybody. To yes. let it flow. And it's a lot, especially taking on filming a movie, but I know you were able to save costs because Richard is multi-talented. So, oh, you know, having you. him be, you know, someone who can do art and someone who can make music, someone who can act. And Kelly, you made your acting de debut also. Yes, the last time I acted was in a high school play. I played Angela Angela Romini from Georgia. Oh, Angela! Yeah, now, yeah Angela. <laughs> what a good name, huh? That means that's Angel. A good by name, the way. good character to play. So Angel. yeah, I mean, and, uh, do say there are ways to save money and budget for a film because you know when you can you know paint or draw and do the artwork for your cover, you know you're not having to hire an illustrator. I mean, look at this fabulous cover. 
And this is Kelly there is. as, uh, there you are, as right Miss the Marino, the teacher. She's she's Lucy's school teacher, and she prepared for that role for 32 years. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Wait, where God's putting us and why? So I, I do want to ask a quick question about the trailer. So you have a trailer for the movie, and I know you know people can find it on YouTube. They can find it on um, Lucy and the Lucy and the Lake Monster But did you? When did you put the trailer together? Was it when the movie was? finished being filmed and you just pulled stuff out or were you able to do it prior? Um, well, we've had clips and different promotional videos we've put up. Um, I think we still need to do a kind of trailer for the big release, the big push, yeah. because right now we're still colorizing and improving the footage and editing and we're still putting champ this guy into it. We, this week hired our video effects person. Um, so to me, like, the ultimate trailer that'll get the most push. Um, I want to wait until the whole film's done to create the poster and trailer, because those are the two things in marketing a film that a lot of people decide whether they want to distribute it, whether they want to see it. So we're going to put a lot of effort and energy into both the final poster and the final trailer, because we want those to be so great. Yeah. Marketing is important. Them. Marketing is very important. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so happy that you both came on today. You know, can you please, you know, Kelly, share with us, Richard, you know, where they can find out or, you know, where they can buy the book. I know. And and obviously, you know, where they can find out more information and, you know, get on some sort of list or something to know when the movie's being coming out. Um, do well, you want me to take that or do you want to answer Kelly on that? You You can go ahead for this part. Well, the book is available in, um, it's available in paperback. There's the paperback and there's the hard, it's also in hard, you know, copy and Kindle. Um, and so it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's on the Walmart website. It's at a store in Port Henry where Champs lives by the, in the lake, a, a, a store, a store called homeofchamp.com. Nice. And um, it's on Ingram Spark. That's where a lot of libraries and bookstores order it. Um, All right. So there's lots of places to find it. And your website yeah. is lucyandthelakemonster.com. Exactly. And they That's can probably it. contact you that way if need be. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really am excited for you. I'm excited to watch this adventure and to go, go read, you know, finish reading the book and see the movie. So Kelly, Richard, thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. You. And we hope to meet you in person when we have a live screening in Massachusetts. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> you could be the be host. There. We could do a Q and a before or after the film with cast and crew, and you could be the interview present presenter uh, before the live audience. Oops. All right. Well, that's what happens with technology. So again, thank you, Richard and Kelly, for coming on the show. And I'm definitely in if they want to do a Q&A after the movie release. So tune in. Well, uh, follow me on Facebook at Why Write. And you'll definitely find out more information about Lucy and the Lake Monster. So thank you so much to all of you who have tuned into this episode of Why Write. I really appreciate you tuning in each week to, you know, watch me learn all about these different writers because I know learning about them for me is helping me and it's going to help you too. So if you haven't been watching the program, this is the time of the show where I have work for you to do. We're going to give you a writing prompt because after all, isn't that why we're here? To find out how we can be writers too. So set your alarm, you know, right after the episode's done, put your, you know, timer on, set your microwave timer, phone timer, watch, whatever. Give yourself five or 10 minutes, whatever you have to do right now, and pick up your pen. And we're going to take a little inspiration from Richard Rossi and Kelly Tabor today because, you know, they created this lake monster, you know, as an you know, kind of a metaphor for different things, you know, whether it's, you know, God or whether it's that scary fear that we have. And I want you to think about, you know, possibly something that you have that you experience yourself um, that you can put a name on, like whether it's, you know, anxiety or joy or fear and give that name a, give the, give that feeling a, a name. So, you know, the Lake Monster's name is champ so give your give that fear a name maybe you're going to call it sue ellen and write a story about you know what sue ellen is like and how you beat sue ellen and had victory in the end just a way to be imaginative and creative
Thank you for turning in to Why Write, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.